<laughs> so today, like a, this is a careers for historians event series, and today we're going to focus on communication skill series. This is one of the AHA, American Historical Association's five essential skills communication, collaboration, digital literacy, quantitative literacy, and collaboration. Did I say collaboration? Collaboration. <laughs> self-confidence. So, oh, intellectual self-confidence. That's why I'm lucky, that's why. So, <laughs> that's why. But, so today we're gonna, we invited the Dr. John Roslan and Michael Harper. So John is, John graduated from the UB Department of History in 2018. So he's been working as the community outreach coordinator at the Old First World Community Center. He also received the Public Humanities Fellow, so he worked on a project entitled Life on the Nichols Edge, Struggle and Dignity in Buffalo's Poor Communities. And his dissertation was about the English working class culture, titled and We'll Help Ourselves, the English Working Class Struggle to remake itself, 1968-1985. And Mike Harper, he's a current MA student here at the UB Department of History. And he was a UB Social Impact Fellow in 2018. I think some of you applied for the next, next um, cycle. So during his fellowship, he worked with Explore Buffalo to promote their program programming and he created a, a curriculum curriculum and program to promote neighborhood history and cultural awareness awareness with Buffalo Public School students. So doctors first, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> So hi everybody, uh, I'd like to thank Shuko for inviting me, Dr. Stapleton for making this happen overall, um, Michael Ely for being my best friend, <laughs> Andy Nero for being my wife. Um, so I finished my PhD um, last May and I got into graduate school and really college in general back when I was 17, 18, thinking about these things uh, because I wanted to be in academia forever. I thought I was going to go through school, get a bunch of degrees, become a professor, and be there. Um, later on in graduate school, that became less and less likely in my mind uh, for a number of reasons. One, it just, the market looked pretty horrible. Um, and two, after TA for a few years, I started to realize how little I actually want to do this kind of work um, as a in front of class professor. And uh, so I was thinking outside of academia, maybe from the time I was a PhD candidate on is when I was really starting to think about like, okay, what else do I actually want to do? While still finishing my PhD, I still like, I, I as Bruce Levine says, I still wanted that badge, like I still wanted that kind of credential, but I didn't really want to do that kind of work. So I was looking outside of it. Um, and uh, that's where the Public Humanities Fellowship came in a little bit, because that was a year long fellowship provided by, uh, I think they're called Humanities New York now, at the time they had a different name. And um, it's a year long fellowship where they give you a chunk of money to basically partner with a local nonprofit organization or series of organizations and uh, create a project dealing with public history sort of broadly conceived. And so my project uh, became an oral history of the development of the uh, Fruit Belt Community Land Trust, uh, which is on the east side of Buffalo, like right on the other side of Main Street um, from the medical corridor. And the problem over there was displacement and like just sort of long-term neglect from the city and um, looking into uh, how to take their own power back. Um, and one of the ways they decided to do this was by um, buying up uh, through a land trust, empty plots of land. If you go over there, mm -hmm. uh, there are plenty of vacant lots, empty houses, and the people who lived in the neighborhood wanted to buy those up so they could control how they get used. Um, and so pretty much uh, by talking to several people, 
um, many, many organizations who have been working in this community generally um, and in the Fruit Belt in particular for many, many years, um, they allowed me to essentially document that. And uh, I created a short documentary film and I uh, wrote up a few reports and made, a, I believe there's an online blog post about it. Um, all of this is available online if you're interested. And uh, then I went on to finish writing my dissertation, had a couple of TA ships. Um, I was a grader my last semester, finished my PhD, and um, was on the job market from maybe the summer before I finished until the summer after of like actively applying for professorships or postdocs or visiting professorships. Um, probably around 100 applications total um, that resulted in one uh, video interview uh, with one school and like maybe one or two like callbacks of like, you know, you're second in the running kind of a thing, but never finishing. And so by June or July of last year, I'm thinking I need to figure out what I'm going to do just for money, um, let alone what the rest of my career is going to be. So I started looking into, um, I was fortunate enough to go back home a uh, year before I graduated and I met with my very first college advisor and was kind of telling him the whole graduate school experience. And he was saying, uh, you know, when you first came to me, you said you wanted to work for NGOs. Like you've always been more of a service oriented person and not so much of a teacher, which I think pans out in the classroom. I've never felt super confident teaching. Um, and so I started looking at nonprofits generally. Um, I looked at United Way, I looked at, um, <clears throat> everything, Red Cross, like whatever you could think of, nonprofit stuff. I wanted to stay in the area, but I also wanted to get around August applied to AmeriCorps, which I had never really heard of uh, prior to that. I was sort of vaguely aware of it, but I had no idea what they did. Um, so I applied for a position through AmeriCorps. Um, so I'm now a service member for AmeriCorps in the Economic Development Corps, which I'll explain a little bit later. And my site placement is at the Old First Ward uh, Community Center, which is, if you're not familiar, the Old First Ward is like uh, where they stopped spending the money that they put into Canal Side. <laughs> so they got to Canal Side, put all the money there, and the Old First Ward is what's left. Um, it's the first neighborhood in Buffalo, as far as I know. I'm not a Buffalo historian, uh, but it's the first neighborhood in Buffalo. It has a long, strong tradition of uh, Catholic, Irish, um, dock workers. Like Those were the people who first settled in this area. And now, uh, the kind of people I help today are multiple generation families, uh, have owned their houses through generations, um, and have generally they at the same time don't seek, but also don't get a lot of uh, help from the bigger uh, citywide government. And part of what the old First Ward Community Center does is try to um, take, there is city funding for things like home rehabilitation and community development, and try to take those monies and find people who qualify and get them to apply for these grants and loans um, that can help them stay in their houses. Uh, a lot of the houses were built between the 1880s and the 1920s um, and have just been ravished through the last century and need things like a new roof, need things like new furnaces, a water heater. And uh, my organization um, for that district is responsible for making that happen. Um, the city has money, they write grants, um, I don't know all the details, and they allocate it to different community-based organizations. Um, so the one I'm at is responsible for mostly the South District of Buffalo, and there's one on the West Side, there's one on University Heights, there's one on the East Side, and um, we're responsible for allocating funds. Um, so that's the kind of broad arc of, uh, you know, going from pretty firmly convinced that even though I wasn't too sure if I'd be good at it, uh, thinking I would become a professor uh, to transitioning out of that into a non-academic 
um, nonprofit world position. Um, this year with AmeriCorps, if anybody's interested, um, AmeriCorps service positions are generally for a year. Um, you're paid a month or a biweekly stipend that's slightly less than we make as TAs. Um, and you have uh, basic health insurance and pretty much no other benefits. Um, my goal in this year of service is to not only do my job at the center, but to actually like get a sense of what working in a nonprofit means, um, how that's different from academia. Um, and so that's been a real learning experience. <laughs> um, some of the things that perhaps you're all interested in um, as far as you know, how getting a PhD or a master's degree in history can help you transition into a uh, nonprofit. Um, so a couple of things, skills I learned as a PhD student. Um, these are all, you know, everybody tells you they're sort of broadly useful, which is more or less true. Um, you get a sense of, you know, being highly organized. I think we all just sort of take that for granted. Uh, we're highly organized or we just sink. Um, and communication skills, which is the whole purpose of this seminar, I guess, um, definitely. Being able to talk to a lot of people um, with like a lot of expectations of what you're expected to do and what you expect of other people and having those dashed and then having to like sort of reevaluate and re reach out to people. Um, I'm sending emails to people all day, every day. Um, oftentimes they're follow-up emails and they're follow-up emails saying, hey, that thing I asked you to do last week, it still hasn't been done yet. Um, I need this to go before I can do the next thing I need to do. Um, so there's a lot of that going on. Um, the research and analysis and the kind of basic things we do to create a dissertation, um, that comes into play in my work a little bit. I do, um, I'm responsible for the resource center at the Old, Old First Ward Community Center, which is something they just <laughs> sort of foisted upon me and I'm creating however I see fit. One of the things I want it to be is a legal clinic for um, housing, uh, law, tenants' rights, um, landlord-tenant relationships, and also things like foreclosure prevention, um, because these are all, I mean, these are all the things that, you know, the first chapter of my dissertation deal with quite extensively. So I wanted to put that into practice in the real world. Um, and so I'm in contact with all the legal, like the neighborhood legal services, the Western New York uh, law offices, uh, the Western New York Legal Center, like all of these organizations that do um, public benefits and housing law, I'm now inviting them to come hold office hours in my resource center to be available for people. Um, prior to doing that, I was just reading a lot of tenants' rights and housing law um, that I could get my hands on and trying to turn that into like handouts, turn that into small sheets, um, turn that into social media posts, put that on our website. Um, so it seemed very, like very familiar for my dissertation. Um, that's almost exactly what I did for chapter one was read a lot of legal uh, housing information and housing law and how people interact with it and then condensing it down into a chapter. Um, so that was all very similar. Um, so that part, that, you know, a nice parallel. The things that have been quite, ex you know, quite different is, um, and one of the things that I think I certainly never got any kind of training on uh, as a PhD student or candidate is um, communicating with people who aren't academics um, and not like, Communicating with people who are not academics without being academical uh, is very difficult in a lot of situations. Um, so many of my interactions with people, uh, we have a, a large senior population, senior citizens, and we also have a lot of youth, young people, high schoolers, and um, they don't care at all that I have a PhD. It, just, it doesn't matter to them. The, the, the letters don't actually even elicit a response. Um, and so like, you know, it, it, introducing myself as, as a doctor or as a PhD just has no bearing whatsoever. Um, and if I can't 
like talk to them about things that actually matter to them. You know, if somebody's uh, you know, worried about their leaking roof and I'm trying to get them funding for it. My, you know, I'm a, I'm an expert in 1970s Britain, you know, for all intents and purposes that does nothing for them. They don't, they don't even want to talk about it. Um, so it, it does take a lot of, a lot of a different, like kind of mindset to talk to people, not only like simplistically or simpler, but like more relevantly. Um, nobody cares about your ability to analyze theory uh, when you're trying to give them money uh, to fix their house. It just doesn't matter. And nobody cares about how good you are about that, um, you know, for other kind of community development things. Even though, like, I came into this thinking, like, my dissertation is fundamentally about community development and poverty alleviation and housing and homelessness. Like, you know, I, I thought I had a pretty solid understanding of these things, but like actually on the ground, it, not really. Um, and so that's one of the things that uh, if you are, you know, finishing your PhD, but thinking of non-academic work, like look broadly into uh, things like that. One of the things I do every day is read all the reports I can find from like uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development or um, different, you know, medical journals, uh, different sort of even, you know, n different nonprofit websites about housing or homelessness or community development uh, to actually get a sense of what people actually care about and what people like what problems are actually out there. Um, and, you know, things people have tried elsewhere. Uh, the I wasn't a part of this planning. But the Community Land Trust over in the Fruit Belt was modeled on a successful attempt in Boston. Um, they did this in Boston a few years ago, and they looked into that and they found, hey, this is this is a way we can control our vacant plots in our neighborhood, and they modeled it on that. And I think, you know, as a historian, it's it seems so simple to obviously like follow an example from the past, but it it, it was hard for me at least to get around the thought of like things are so much different, even from like 30 years ago, 20 years ago, like there's new problems that require new solutions. And so I try to stay on top of that in the time that I'm not doing community outreach and other stuff. Um, how much time do I have left? There was another point. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you don't want me to talk the whole time, though. Believe me, I can. Um, no, so with uh, like one of the, the the big thing I wish that I would have um, received in terms of training or even just orientation with um, once I decided to not pursue academia all that hard. I mean, I filled out a bunch of applications because I was hopeful, but it got pretty clear pretty early on that at least for this year, I'm not going to land a professorship. Like it just became really clear really early on, like this just isn't going to happen. And there was a lot of like, you know, anger at this institution about failing to prepare me for the real world. Um, but one of the things that uh, I definitely wish we had more exposure to, and maybe this is part of that, is just once you decide to actually get out of academia to not pursue a professorship or, you know, no offense to anybody here if you had a part of this, but like I remember brown bags of, you know, alternative academic careers where they would suggest like get a museum job or become a librarian both of which need different graduate degrees, first of all, yeah. and both of which are basically academia. Um, so, you know, those, those were not helpful. And uh, they, you know, they weren't helpful for getting either of those kind of jobs, but they also weren't helpful for thinking about getting jobs outside of academia. Um, so I wish there, I wish we had more exposure to that. I wish, um, there would have been more like just more honesty about like getting an academic job is first of all nearly impossible and also um if you're thinking about getting a job outside of academia you need to think about it more so than like 
two hours a week or like <laughs> reading a few job postings, you know, in between classes. Like it's 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 such a shift of the difference of um, you know applying to one job or another. Um, you know, I went I, I interviewed for the job I have now, and uh, instead of a resume, I just gave them my CV, and I mm -hmm. believe they were just so overwhelmed by it that they're like, you must be qualified. Um, <laughs> they're, they're expecting a half page resume from somebody because I'm, I'm, I am totally overqualified for my position, although I like it. Um, but like they're expecting a, a high school uh, graduate or maybe somebody with an associate's degree with that amount of experience. And instead they get, you know, 10 pages of publications and conferences and classes and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, there's more of a sense of preparing for that part of the job market uh, would have been nice or more of a sense of, you know, I had this broad idea of I wanted to be in a nonprofit position that helps with housing and community development because that's what my research interests were. Um, but no sense of what that actually is. What are some job titles for that kind of work? Uh, what do you even apply for? So that was something I wish I got more of while I was here. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Did you go to career services while you were here? And mm -hmm. if so, were they helpful? Um, yes and no. They were very helpful with, I wanted to, um, like, I wanted to basically judge up my CV. I wanted it to look more professional. I wanted it to be more organized. They were very helpful with that. Um, as far as, like, I'm getting a PhD in history and I don't want to be a history professor. Can you help me? They weren't. Um, like Apple. I had a similar experience. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and, and I mean, I'm, I'm just going to plug my center a little bit. Um, I am holding, uh, I'm in the process of holding a, a jobs and careers fair at the old first ward community center sometime this spring. Um, and my experience with the career fairs here as a history PhD was that they have nothing for us. Mm -hmm. Like they don't even try. Like this school basically has forgotten us. Um, you know, there'll be, you'll have a range of um, <coughs> being a doctor in some, you know, a medical doctor in some case, um, or being a, an electronic engineer of some sort, or being a cashier at Target. Like that's the range of, job opportunities that are typically at these career fairs. So I just, I never went to them. So uh, we had Ed Brodka from Career Services here last year. Mm -hmm. And he uh, told me that when he meets with graduate students, he, he talks to them about LinkedIn mm -hmm. as a really good tool mm -hmm. for exploring options. And I don't know if you've tried that because what he said was <clears throat> basically you could do a lot of informational interviews because you find other UB graduates through LinkedIn at positions that seem interesting to you, mm -hmm. and then you kind of build a network that way. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's told me was the approach he recommended. At Broadcut is paid by the like, yeah. Oh, okay. uh, yeah. Uh, that, yeah. And when I was a public humanities fellow, um, we had training. And one of them was all about LinkedIn and increasing your network. And I think like we all networked with each other like around the table that day. And then we all continued to not look at it because it's just, it doesn't serve us. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I don't have any good opinions about LinkedIn. I look at it, you know, every few months when somebody requests a I think that, that for certain, uh, for certain disciplines, LinkedIn is actually yeah. something that certain, like my husband's an attorney and they use LinkedIn a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think outside of those particular professions, it's not the most mm -hmm. useful tool. Yeah, I'd agree. It's kind of like the career fairs here, where right? it's like there are career fairs for like STEM or you know something like that. But as far as liberal arts, it's like, well, if you're not going to become a professor, you know, you can be a manager at Eddie Bauer, I guess. Like, mm -hmm. That's kind of the options, uh, mm -hmm. or or you can you know go back to school to get uh, an MLS and you know become a librarian, or go back to school and get some other qualifications to be, you know go to a museum. Like there doesn't seem to be any good transition. Yeah, right. I'm wondering if in terms of networking, um, uh, if, if if anybody has like um, 
responded to the AHA's um, encouragement to to look through the, the kinds of people around the country who are interested in mentoring people or at least having a conversations with them. Mm -hmm. Did you know that? They they have a they have a I mean Shuko probably knows more about this yeah. than I do the career contacts. So there's some there's some like a broader mentorship opportunity. So the professors pair with students, but I don't know how that would be good for. Just for oh, it's depending on the I mentor. Thought, I thought the idea was people outside of. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, they recruited they recruited a lot okay. of people who have advanced degrees in history mm -hmm. who work. Who are not professors? Okay. Who oh, are okay. in management positions or mm -hmm. nonprofits or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so you could, John, you could actually register as yeah okay. to, to mm -hmm. get a mentor. And mm -hmm. the people that run it at the AHA would then ask you what your interests are, and then try to find someone who works in the area you're interested in mm -hmm. and put you in touch. Yeah, sounds wonderful. I, I would let you know about that. Okay. Yeah. The email. Yeah, and it doesn't <laughs> surprise me. Um, there, there's also it's interesting that by about. July or August, I just stopped thinking about university life entirely. Um, and, uh, you know, I wasn't applying for jobs. I wasn't doing anything with it. I haven't looked at my dissertation since I turned it in. Like, I'm kind of taking like a gap year as well. And so there's a lot of things that, you know, get lost. Like, I wasn't aware of that, even though it was <laughs> presented to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just think that. Um... There have to be a lot of uh, a lot of PhDs like yourself who are in who who desire to be in the nonprofit world and the whole uh, area of uh, planning, city planning, and, um, and services, urban services, and housing. I mean, in terms of what you were talking about trying to keep up with um, experiments and initiatives that were happening across the country. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if you were um, if you were connected nationally with several people who were doing this, it would give you ideas about um, conferences that were happening yeah. and also ways that would in a sense credential you but I'm not talking about going back to school mm -hmm. um, yeah and actually interestingly enough there is a conference uh, coming up on the first of March at Hilbert College um, that's basically it's connecting and how to work with each other um, you like college all the colleges in the area are going to be there and like nonprofits so it's going to be it's specifically focused on that uh which i learned about just doing my regular job at the old first ward um and so that i am going to that I'll, i can forward the information to you if you want to attend um but that that's something like that 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 would definitely like and you know maybe reach out to those kind of like attend to those things while you're still in school if you're thinking about a non-academic career would be a really good idea, so, which I would have. So the AHA career contacts are for the academic administration, nonprofit management, public policy, archives and library, K-12 teaching, and other federal government and private industry sectors. So it does actually, it's, it'd be great for... Yeah, no, that, sound, that sounds great. I will re-look at it. Mm -hmm. I sent you a forward to the information. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no promises. I, I just learned I have Monday off, so I'm not going to this weekend. <laughs> yes. I don't know if you're saying I want this resource, but also the United Way is a great resource to yeah. stay moved into. Yeah. If you're looking for jobs outside of academia, yeah. um, they're, they send like a weekly email update mm -hmm. with current positions that are opening up at different nonprofits in the area, and therefore a range of backgrounds and experiences, expertise. 
Um, so just go on the United Way of Buffalo website to sign up for that newsletter. Yeah. It's also just a good way to stay informed about different communities it, that's happening with nonprofits. It definitely is. I get their weekly newsletter or whatever. And, yeah. um, and that's actually where I originally started to look. It's I, mm -hmm. I asked one of the people I worked with on the fellowship how to look into nonprofit jobs, and he said mm -hmm. the United Way yeah. posts. Um, the bit of advice I actually meant to give is while you're still in school, um, I didn't do this at all, so and I wish I would have. But like, volunteer, like intern, get into you know the kind of places that you think you want to work at and learn something about them, um, and also gain the experience for it because uh, a lot of the kind of jobs you're talking about also don't care that you have a PhD in history. Um, but if in addition to a PhD in history, you have a couple of years of experience in the nonprofit sector doing the kind of work you're applying for, that looks much better. Um, that will be much more helpful, much more effective. Um, this AmeriCorps position is I'm doing that, you know, kind of on purpose for this reason. You have a year of experience doing this kind of work that hopefully turns into many more years of doing this kind of work. The department also um, would work with you if you wanted to do an internship for credit. Mm. We do have that option on the books. Uh, it, it's a, we have to set it up because somebody has to supervise it and figure out what the parameters are for the history part of it. Yeah. Uh, but it is possible. <laughs> yeah, again, I didn't do any, I, you know, I, I did my dissertation. And the advice I kept getting from all my advisors is just do your dissertation, which I think is unhelpful advice. Um, it'll be more work and it'll cause you more stress, but finishing your dissertation doesn't matter to a lot of people if you're not going into academia. Um, so, you know, I would say put yourself through worse hell than being a PhD <laughs> candidate already is um, and do work outside of. Um, I mean, you know, Andy, you're teaching, actually teaching mm -hmm. children. Um, and using technology, mm -hmm. you know, which is better experience and better pain than being a TA. I get a lot more job offers now that I'm doing that, and it's actually like college-oriented things, like mm -hmm. um, adult education, um, ESL for adults, things like that. So like, this is just a starting thing. I could do something else later, but I kind of like some things about my job. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I just want to put in a word for uh, credentials, uh, whether they're uh, directly um, important to the 75-year-old uh, uh, person in the first ward who's got a leak in the roof. Um, it's, it's, uh, it, it almost sounded as though you were saying that the advice to finish um, wasn't, wasn't ideal um, and that it was kind of uh, binary choice there, um, I would say that uh, taking some time out to do the kinds of things that you're encouraging um, sounds fantastic, but, um, uh, but just in terms of, of your own feelings of accomplishment to um, push through to actually finishing uh, the, the degree that you started. It'll, You'll, you'll be happier than if you had just dropped it mm -hmm. and not and, and not done those last three chapters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, like I you know, was citing Bruce Levine's whole thing of like, I wanted that badge. Like, I did. I, I got into school because I wanted a PhD in history. Um, at some point, I had to reconcile that having a PhD in history is not a uh, job guarantee. And I feel like it's sold to us, to society at large, that education is a job guarantee, that more degrees is a job guarantee, and that's just rubbish. Um, you know, even, even if you do get a PhD and become a professor, you're an extreme minority of society. You know, it's just not that likely. Um, and so, like, I think, yeah, at, at some point I just had to come to terms with, I want to be a doctor of history. Um, and then I'm probably going to do something else to pay the bills. <laughs> uh, Shuka, that's all I have. I don't know how you 
want this yeah. scheduled. Um, thank you. <laughs> Um, hi, my name is uh, Michael Harper. Um, as I just did my sort of presentation part up here, um, just a little about me. I um, did my undergrad at um, Syracuse University, and I can't remember my password. Um, <laughs> I can't tell. I can't tell you about that. Um, and uh, so I, I studied English and history at Syracuse. Um, <laughs> which was um, really good fun at, at Syracuse. It was English textual studies, so I, it wasn't just English literature. They sort of, um, I could take classes on pop culture, on theater. Um, and then I, I took several years off um, before starting my master's degree. And to be quite honest with you, I, I really just started my master's degree because my mom pressured me into it. Um, <laughs> so I emailed Dr. Radford and said, could I come talk to you about what the process is of you know, becoming a a history grad student, um, and luckily enough, she said, "Well, if you can get your application and references in, in a month, uh, we'll just take you." I was like, "Okay." <laughs> so I didn't apply anywhere else. Uh, That's pretty much how we live. Oh, so, um, I, I wouldn't have said that to everyone. Yeah, well, you were hopeful. You were shining. So, um, so I, in that time um, between undergrad and, um, and starting here at UB, I uh, continue to work for uh, Wegmans. Um, I worked for the Dollar Tree on and off for several years um, throughout high school and, and college, just on holidays um, and summers when I was home. And um, and I just moved into uh, Wegmans because they were willing to pay me a quarter more an hour. So, um, But I've been there several years now, for about, uh, just over four and a half years now. Um, now I work in their accounting office. Um, and. Uh, at the time I, I came in to speak to Dr. Edward, I did think that ultimately I was going to sort of um, you know enter upper management at Wegmans and then and and then move on and, and take control of a department or something like that. Uh, but I think my parents kind of had a different vision for me. Um, they knew I would I'd always loved school, and I think they felt like it was just time for me to go back. Um, so um, so this is my fourth and final semester as a master's student. Ideally, if I finish my um, my MA thesis, and um, I haven't actually started the job on yet at all. So, um, but last summer I was uh, invited to join a program at the UB sponsors called um, Social Impact Fellowships, and I believe it was the third year of um, of the program. So, just very briefly, the UB Social Impact Fellowship it's a collaboration between UB's uh, business schools and their social work schools. Um, sort of to offer a chance for students from different backgrounds, different disciplines, um, and with different perspectives and skills to come together and work together. So each um, MSW student is paired off with um, a business student um, over the summer, and they end up being placed at different locations and sort of working on predetermined projects um, that the organization has uh, laid out for them. And last year, luckily enough, um, they decided to invite a few students from the humanities um, to sort of it's kind of an experiment to see how they would um, work with three-person teams and sort of what perspectives and views we could bring um, to them. So we had one history student who was myself, um, a student from the geography department, and one from sociology. Um, and ultimately, the Social Impact Fellowship it sort of culminates um, after your two-month placement. Um, at the end of July, they had this big pitch, and we ended up, every team had to go on stage and sort of pitch their program. Um, to a panel, and then two out of the ten teams that were competing um, would would be awarded a grant to sort of continue their um, their program that they've been working on. Um, so I was invited to join, and um, so before we get into um, into the actual experience, um, I have maybe just a show of hands, like how many people here have worked from with someone from another discipline outside of their own, and um, how many of you sort of maybe got the feeling or had some sort of experience with, um, I guess we'll just call it prejudice, academic prejudice. Um, so like, what do people think about? So what, what were some things that maybe you felt or were sort of said about who you are and how you operate just because you come from your background? Um, I always get the question, oh, do you want to be a teacher? Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
I'm a historian of science, so I talk to a lot of scientists, and they're like, you can't really do history of science. You don't know science. You don't know. So, okay. kind of <laughs> so does medicine, yeah. yeah. I do my dissertation is contemporary history, I guess, and uh, I, a lot of, a lot of people will either think that I, I should really just do journalism, or that like it's not real history in one sense or another. Um, I had a receptionist at a doctor's office say, "Oh, it's nice when we get when our hobbies can be something that we want to pursue in school." <laughs> And I'm thinking, you're just better about your job. <laughs> <laughs> so there you have it. Um, so that was the, um, the social impact fellowship. It started with a week-long sort of crash course right after term ended in May, um, just for everyone to get to know each other. And also, I think, to introduce um, students from the different schools to concepts that they'd sort of be working with, um, whether that's social work concepts for business students, um, all the concepts for me, because I didn't know any of it. Um, but this was sort of an experiment we did on the first day, was going around the room and asking everyone to introduce themselves, where they come from, what their background is, and then maybe just sort of compile a list of sort of stereotypes that you have um, as far as, you know, social work, business, and humanities students go. Um, so for the humanities, like you all said, your example, I think what we mostly got was that we're really boring, we don't like to interact with other people, um, that we're snotty, um, and that we're snotty. So. Um, <laughs> So business student, as you might expect, um, a lot of stereotypes ended up being sort of like, you know, they're only focused on money, um, majority male, uh, they're, you know, sort of cold, heartless, uncaring people. <laughs> and uh, for the social work students, it almost ended up being like the complete opposite, that it was overwhelmingly female, um, sort of bleeding liberal, um, and that they don't actually get anything done, really. They just sort of pretend that they get stuff done. Um, so those were all the stereotypes that we had to deal with um, and sort of overcome. So that was sort of the first, I think, communication um, that sort of hurdle that, that every team had to overcome. Um, luckily, my team, my partner was great, Jackson Marr. Um, he was a, a social work student, MSW too. Um, and our business student actually dropped out of the program, so it was just the two of us. Um, so luckily, we were one of the three-person teams. That would be really, really awkward. Um, so, I mean, so in a sense, I, I don't think that all of the stereotypes are, um, I don't think any of them are necessarily true. Um, but for myself, I did feel that, like, the Social Impact Fellowship, it was a really good opportunity because um, I had tended, I felt like I had tended to isolate myself um, as far as, you know, I think a lot of historians, we don't really enjoy working with other people, at least that's what everyone in my class says, whenever we get to a group assignment, we're like, we just start growing and, um, <laughs> and don't actually end up working in groups. I think you just end up communicating via email and being like, okay, as long as you have this done by this day, I'll have this done and we'll just start together and that's our group project. Um, <laughs> so I really appreciated the opportunity to sort of get to um, meet other people from the school, um, which was a kind of a new experience for me. I think especially not going to UB as an undergrad and then coming in for my master's, um, I still have only been to uh, like a quarter of the buildings on campus. Just people ask me for directions now, two years in, I'm like, I, I don't know. Um, so, so that was a really good experience for me to be able to meet people from different schools and different disciplines. Um, and like I said, luckily, um, our group didn't have any major issues. Uh, so my partner and I got along um, very well. From the beginning, um, I know there were a couple instances though where teams did have communication problems, um, and when you're working towards a goal that is money involved at the end of it, um, things can start to get a little tense about halfway through the project when you don't actually have a project or you don't know what your organization is asking you to do. Um, but we started working at Explore Buffalo. Um, so Explore Buffalo, for those who don't know, is a, a nonprofit organization um, that I believe was founded in late 2013. But really started operating in um, in 2014 and explore Buffalo. Uh, their main goal is to organize a sort of variety of walking tours that showcase Buffalo's history um, and, and background, including architecture, art, um, and they also partner with other organizations to um, for other other tours that don't involve walking, um, <laughs> like kayaking, bus. Um, and so, um, so our job was to work with Paige Mellon, who's the education coordinator at Explore Buffalo. And sort of the project that she had laid out um, was um, for Buffalo Public Schools. Um, and 
So she sort of like broke down the demographics of the schools that were touring with her throughout the year. Um, and we got to go on several of those tours because um, the service term was just ending up for a lot of these kids. Um, and a lot of kids from DC didn't have the opportunity to go on any of these tours. Um, and when they did, my partner and I felt like, um, even though as a student of history, um, it was really nice to sort of have these sort of architecture walking tours around Buffalo to see, you know, Buffalo landmarks and stuff like that. We were, we wanted to do something that um, sort of showcased the the neighborhoods that these children are, are growing up in um, and not make them feel like the city is something distant that they don't have a real connection to. Um, so, so we lost our business partner. Um, and uh, I have our poster. Ultimately, we had to sort of before you go and pitch, you have to design a poster and hand it in. Uh, so this was our poster. There's Jackson and myself. <laughs> um, and so what we really wanted to do, especially after going um, with a couple of the Buffalo schools, Buffalo public schools on um, tours, was sort of like I said, get them in, involved in um, design something that would be, I think, more emotionally sort of like. Um, uh, they would connect with them more emotionally than just sort of like a standard bubble walking tour. Um, but we also did have to have a sort of standard <laughs> component to it. Um, so since Explore Buffalo already does a lot of work um, on the Street of the Year Canal, that was one half of our program. Um, and then the other half, um, we sort of looked around at different neighborhoods, and um, I sort of drew upon some personal experience that I had. My mom, um, I think really since I got for about four years now, five years, um, I got home from college, my mom was just like, hey, I'm going out. I signed up to work with Jericho Road. Um, so I'm going to meet like this Nepali family that I'm mentoring. And like, okay. Um, but it's been a great experience for meeting. So my mom ended up working um, through Jericho Road with the Priscilla Project. Um, and so she's mentored several families from Nepal over the last um, four or five years as they sort of like acclimated to life in Buffalo. Um, her main role, I guess, was sort of guiding them through pregnancies. Um, and But since then, she's sort of like, not working with them officially, she's just stayed in touch and sort of become like her surrogate family. Um, so listening to their story was really incredible and seeing schools like Buffalo Public School 45, the International School, um, at Explore Buffalo, it's sort of like the walking tours that we got to do ourselves. Um, that was something we wanted to draw in. So we thought to ourselves like, well, Buffalo has such a great sort of immigrant history. Um, in many ways, I think that history has been in the last 10 years or so, um, new chapters have been added to it. So what we really wanted to do was highlight that for our um, the second part of our, our walking tour. So we designed our own walking tour around the West Side neighborhoods. Um, I think really specifically focused on West Side Bazaar, um, Grant, Westbury, areas like that where you could sort of like show off the um, older populations, older ethnic populations that used to live there um, with sort of like landmarks like Gershio and Sons and different restaurants and churches there. Um, but ultimately built towards you know, reconnecting them with that, that past, but also telling them, you know, like that you're you're sort of making your own history here. So even though you might feel displaced, you might feel like Buffalo is, you know, such a foreign, strange city to you, um, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. And it was for these people many, many years ago. And look how, you know, how things have uh, turned out and come full circle. So there was our poster. Mm. Um, is that available on the web or? This poster? Yeah. Um, no, this was my personal copy. Okay, but I personal. Could, okay. Uh, <laughs> it looks awesome. And uh, it was really cool. They actually printed off the posters and um, sort they of took, displayed they them. They took your professional photo too, didn't they? They did, yeah. yeah it was <laughs> kind of a nightmare um, <laughs> because it took it took all day, but um, they had us in, I don't even know the building, with the law library and sort of, they had us in one of those rooms over there for the day, but they didn't have the air on, like, at all, oh, yeah. in any building in the school. So, like, that picture looks okay, but I was sweat, I was drenched, like, I don't know, I didn't have a coat on, I'm like, oh my god, this is terrible. Um, but they did do that. So there were a lot of cool, um, sort of little touches like that, and especially for students and humanities, if anyone here is interested or has applied for the program, I highly encourage you to do so. Um, it was a really great experience. I'm not sure how they're going to organize it. Um, I. I know like that when I was chosen to participate in the program, they had already given me a placement because they wanted us to, you know, from the humanities to sort of like use the skills that we already had and not have to just be thrown into somewhere like um, you know, like go to the Jewish community center and see, you know, what you can do. Um, so Explore Buffalo was chosen for me, um, and it was it was a really great experience. 
Um, but you also get to kind of experience something that I don't think any of us have, I had certainly never had any experience pitching or standing in front of a crowd and um, asking for money, which is um, sort of a nerve wracking experience. Um, and so that was a lot of the program is, you know, part of the program is designing, you know, what you want and what you're gonna ask the money for. And then like really the big culmination of the program is asking for that money um, in two minutes. So you have to take everything that you've done over the summer and condense it into two minutes and convince them, you know, give me, give me this. Um, with a hard time limit and a really nasty buzzer that will just cut you off, <laughs> and that's it, and, and you're done. Um, so that was really, you know, something that I think a lot of the business students were familiar with. Like they were, you know, this was kind of old hat for them. Like they knew how to prepare. Um, I didn't at all, but luckily the people in the, who were running the program, like Ezra Staley, um, he was super helpful, and so they give you the template and everything to design this. So really, you you know, you have to put the work in. Um, and then it, it does feel like sort of a culmination of, of, of just a, a lot of work. Um, they had great food, great spread out. Um, <laughs> um, so learning to communicate that way was, a, it was a challenge at first, um, because I, I think, I think going over the stereotypes on the first day was a really good idea, but I think in some ways it was a really bad idea because it, um, so sort of like you get in your own mind then and you're like, uh -huh. oh, I mean, or am I being <laughs> snotty? Like I didn't answer that text. I hope I hope they don't think you know I'm ignoring them or something. Um, so in that sense, you know, um, and like I said, luckily my partner Jax and I we didn't have any serious issues. But I know there were teams who had issues um, where they did have to sort of confront their partner and say like you're not doing anything, you know, or, or neither of us know what we're doing, so we really need to figure that out. Um, and then I know a couple other groups had issues with their actual placement. The organization they were placed with, they had to go to them and say like, hey, we've been here for three weeks, I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, and sometimes you just sort of need that little you know, nudge. And, and I think that was another sort of history stereotype was like none of us are willing to ask any questions. We're just gonna sort of like plow ahead. And, uh, so I would encourage you to not do that. Um, I that's well, well. Huh. Um, these are just pictures. These are just a couple of pictures. Um, so the last, I guess, um, to close on the point of communication, though, um, one of the, I think, best lessons that I took from the program um, was from that sort of like week-long crash course. Um, and if any of you do become the Social Impact Fellow, um, I encourage you to read and actually do the reading that week. I know it's right after your exams ended, but um, then you'll end up with this sort of like, you know, you all know that awkward silence, where it's like, you know, what happened here? And, know the answer is but if you did it like I did then you can be the only one who's like and you can fulfill <laughs> the last stereotype of the history majors that we're all sort of um suck offs and, and we just, um, that's all we do is read. Yeah, it's funny because when Gail and I met the people that run this program and they were gushing over Michael Harper. It was because of that first week I'm sure. It was a good oh, week. Yeah it was a nice week. But all I did was actually do the reading. So <laughs> but um but one of the readings um, and a, a TED Talk video that went along with it um, was presented by um, Tom Ulbrich, who is the um, business professor sort of like working with us that week. And he showed us a video of a gentleman who had worked in sort of the for-profit sector for a long time, but had moved into the nonprofits um, and was doing sort of outreach um, work in Africa. And so he went and explained how, um, being a good Italian boy, he sort of looked around at the area, saw they needed food, and was like, oh, great tomatoes like we'll just grow they have they have all like the, the tools they need to grow tons of tomatoes and they grew all their tomatoes and a bunch of wild animals came over and ate it um so he asked the villagers he was like well like we'll try it again blah blah, blah. and then he said eventually like i realized that they were just letting the animals eat all the tomatoes <laughs> because i never asked them what they wanted and they don't eat tomatoes they have no use for tomatoes whatsoever um so that was sort of the, like i think the strongest communication lesson that i took um from the SIP program was always, which is you know sort of a business concept that I think could be applied to you know anywhere in your life. Like if you have an audience and if you're working <clears throat> to do something for someone, then make sure that what you're working to do is actually something that they want um, and, and that will be useful to them. And so that was an important skill for us and um, designing our program for Explore Buffalo. I think to, to take that step back and you know as a history student say like oh I think you know the history of Erie Canal is wonderful. We should just do an entire program on, on what it was like to live 
you know, in the um, early 19th century, and my sort of social work partner was like, but why? Like, you know, who, who, who is getting what out of this? Um, and so, unfortunately, we did end up, well, we, not unfortunately, but we did end up incorporating the York Canal because we had to fulfill some New York State Common Core requirements. <laughs> um, but that sort of led us back to the drawing board to say, like, okay, like, if we're working, if our audience is public school kids, um, you know, what can we do that will sort of have an impact for them? Um, so, uh, yeah. I think this is the one, sorry. <laughs> your last point about knowing your audience and communicating well, did, so, and maybe Andy has something to say to this too, because kids of that age, I mean, I think people in college have no conception of what kids of that age hmm. can take in. And did you do a lot of reading about that? Or I know, I know you have a nephew, right? We got to meet with several um, teachers from the public schools to ask them. So we got to, we didn't get a ton of time to speak with the teachers that were actually on the tours, but so we observed the teachers that were on the tours and then got to speak with um, more teachers, you know, sort of um, in separate meetings. Um, we also met with um, sort of coordinating at um, the Darwin Martin House and um, the Buffalo History Society. And so we did talk extensively about that to see, you know, like what age groups can handle um, what. And that was another sort of lesson that I had to take. I started designing a lot of activities for the classroom that I thought were really nice and cool. Um, and then I, my partner, again, it's something like you can't ask like eighth graders to sort of like pull apart this poem, you know, on, on the York Canal, Mark Twain, you can't, you just can't do that. Um, so we did have to sort of um, think about time in terms of like designing the length of the actual walking, um, you know, like where's a good spot to stop, like what's a good building that's like not too in the way, um, because most of the teachers said, you know, these kids like they're, they're gonna wanna stop after 20 minutes, they're gonna want a snack break, inevitably, some of them will have to go to the bathroom. Yeah. Um, but most importantly, like you just you can't overload them with you know um, sort of an hour, an hour and a half long tour of the West Side. You know, keep it at you know forty five minutes, fifty minutes, depending on on your age group. Um, so just things like time, you know, you really have to. And he, and my nephew, yeah, he did sort of help me out because he's. Um, I think he has a pretty good attention span, but he has a really good attention span for like. Like iPads and stuff. <laughs> um, so like he could spend five or six hours like watching YouTube if you let him. Um, but you know if you try to if you walk him outside, he loves being outside. But he you know he just wants to be all over the place. So um, so that was you know that was sort of like an, another challenge for me. Um, I think my my partner uh, he had an easier time with it. Um, but for me, like sort of you know having to step back constantly and, and say like, well, I think this is really interesting. And like, what do you mean? They, you know, they won't get it, or they don't want to do it, or you know. Um, so finding sort of finding that balance, um, you know, was was kind of challenging. But, um, but I think it's you know it's rewarding, and that sort of goes back to, to really knowing what audience you're, you're working with here. So. Oh, this out there. I know one thing that I wish I had in grad school was um, some workshops and stuff on the different ways to communicate with audiences because. Mm -hmm. Um, I've worked in a nonprofit, so obviously there's like um, a different level there. And then I'm going to be giving my first public talk in <coughs> April, um, like at a public library. And so I'm really nervous about that. And so thinking about how you translate your work and your research mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. different audiences, and obviously now with Twitter and mm -hmm. blogs and stuff like that, mm -hmm. um, I know some. Especially like the sciences, I think they have a whole field of science communication mm -hmm. and uh, some of the programs on the courses and workshops and stuff like that. And I think it would be great with the humanities on the humanities communication. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have any tips for pitching at all? Mm -hmm. um, that might be relevant. Uh, pra practice. Like if you have a time limit, then practice as much as you can. Um, I didn't have any no cards or anything today, um, but uh, but we did have no cards during the, the actual pitch. Um, I, yeah, that was really I think the, the biggest thing was like just you know being prepared and going in and, and um, giving yourself some leeway in terms of time um, and also knowing you know like I guess knowing how to read your audience live and you know if something is just bombing then you need to move on from it very quickly. <laughs> Um, luckily for us, like the two, you know, the biggest issue we had was was the, the time limit. Um, 
and not really just the constraint of it because after you get done introducing yourself, you know, it, it can feel like, oh, you know, I didn't really get to talk about this or this or this. Like I was like, I didn't get to show any of my worksheet activities. Like, um, and uh, and as far as the competition goes, I think everyone will tell you over the whole summer, don't worry about the competition. You know, it's not a real competition. You know, like you're doing great work, blah blah blah, which is all true. Um, and so you should not let yourself get into a mindset. It's a really weird thing where it's, you know, you're competing for something, but since you're all doing good work, you know, they, they don't want you to feel like you're competing with each other, but you really are. Um, and so you can, you can really go one of two ways. Um, and I, I think for a little while I went like the bad direction. I was like, <laughs> fast. I can't believe we didn't win. Like it's ridiculous. Um, but, but everyone did a you know a tremendous mm -hmm. job, and, um, and luckily, like I said, I don't think that we didn't have like any major issues. I don't want to say that like you won't have any major issues at all, but um, but it was a really really good good group of students, um, and they went through a much 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 longer interview process than I did. So um, so I think they were just happy to be there. Like and they were sick. we made it. So. Thank you. Um, for the program before the pitch and everything like that. Um, what exactly is that process? Is, was there an application or did like, someone recommend you or? Um, I don't really know. You I just got probably, an email one day. Probably that said, that oh. better. <laughs> so as Michael said, it was social work and, and uh, business school. And then uh, somebody in the College of Arts and Sciences who used to work in business school said, we should really get our arts and sciences students involved. And so she actually contacted me and the DGS of sociology and the DGS of geography and said, can you nominate some students? Because their whole application process for social work and business, they'd already gone through it. Yeah. They'd already cho chosen the nine or 10 projects. They'd already assigned ma master's students to it from social work and MBA students. So we just actually you know, talked among ourselves and thought of people that we thought would be good and ended up recommending Michael. And this year, I actually sent around to the history department listserv you know, the fact that there was an opportunity to encourage people to talk to Michael. I don't know if anybody applied from history. Um, I don't really know. I know a couple of people reach out to ask me a couple of questions, so I don't know. If they so have. it could be that somebody applied. It could be, well, have another history student in it. It could be, we won't, because this time they had to go through the regular process. Uh, um, but I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think one of the winning teams was the one that had a geography student on it. It was, yep, yeah. So, and actually that highlights to me mm -hmm. the importance of a kind of visual communication because right. that woman had incredible GIS yes. Yes, images and stuff. Yeah. And it really added, I thought, a mm -hmm. lot to their, their, it was like a five minute presentation, right? The pitch was like five or six minutes. Yeah. So they had these incredible maps. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it brought home to me how that kind of visualization skill is another really important mm -hmm. mode of communication. GIS is huge too. Like every time I go to a conference in the past like five years, they're mm -hmm. like, we have a GIS map. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so yeah. it's like, <laughs> yeah. How can historians use GIS? I mean, so many ways. <clears throat> okay. You can even plot. Uh, I, I saw one project where they were talking about smallpox inoculations mm -hmm. okay. uh, in colonial America, mm -hmm. and someone got a grant from. Um, NSF to do a like, mm. grant to do a GIS yeah. map, uh, mapping where the inoculations occurred mm -hmm. over time. There's so many uses for it. Mm -hmm. It would be really useful if you have to open it. When I was a public humanities uh, fellow or whatever it was called that John and I both did, um, one of the projects that one of the other, not in my year, but one of the people that brought in to like demonstrate what other fellows had done, mm -hmm. had done this crazy GIS project mm -hmm. that was like tracking like the way that a certain art movement or something had moved around in New York State. Mm -hmm. So there's like so many different history projects use mapping. Mm -hmm. It's beyond my capabilities, but it's, it's yeah. fascinating. You'd have to like take a class to learn it. Oh yeah. I think it's super Actually, I've taken uh, sorry, I've taken the GIS class like a long time ago and I forgot how to use it. <laughs> That's why. But yeah, I mean obviously you can sign up for the from the geography department for uh -huh. a GIS class. Yeah. Well, so you can do it. That's why I did. I will say I can talk a little bit about this time in March, but um, so I've taken some workshops and stuff in GIS, mm -hmm. and I yeah. use it uh, a little bit for looking at migration. Mm -hmm. And um, now that there's ArcGIS online, it's not quite as robust as the like desktop version and stuff. But there are a lot of things that you can do 
um, to visualize stuff mm -hmm. easier now than you used to be able to. Mm -hmm. Can you can you buy from like a department discount or like a university discount, like a ten dollars or something for the full GIS? You can you can get it as yeah. a student. Yeah. You actually end up going through somebody. Uh, there's somebody in. <laughs> administration but also sitting in the library in the server. Mm -hmm. He's retiring, so I'm gonna have to ask him mm -hmm. what's gonna happen with that. But anything. Yeah, I think you can buy cheap. Yeah, the general question in regards to uh fellowships and generally uh, how does one go about seeking to find potential fellowships to apply for? Do you guys want me to talk about it? Since I did so many <laughs> last week, I just for, for, this, for this year, I did not apply to any next year. I just don't have the time. I want to get this dissertation done. But um, I went and looked for every organization that did. I do colonial American history of science, and um, I looked for every organization that does anything close to that. I uh, subscribed to H Year, so that's the Early Republic um, H Net. Branch, so you would find one that you know matches what you do. Does everybody know about HNet? Yeah, if you don't know, I yeah. hope you take that away from this. <laughs> yeah, HNet is good. Yes, yeah, so on that. We have a whole collection of listservs that people subscribe to if they're interested in a particular area of the world or a particular aspect of history. Mm -hmm. And then it's basically an information sharing uh, method. And they share so many fellowships. Mm -hmm. I probably applied to like 30. I got two, so I feel like I did pretty well. Yeah, that's <laughs> I got two good. really good ones. Yeah. Um, but I, I would warn you before you go into fellowships, a lot of people think it's just free money, and it is definitely not free money. You will probably put some of your own money into the traveling that goes mm -hmm. on. Um, you have to be able to give up a good amount of, of your time, and there's so much organizing that goes on, especially if it's like a research travel grant. It's ridiculous. I spent a lot of time working <laughs> fellowships this year when I wish I were dissertating. So there, there's good and bad there. Um, definitely not free money, don't let anyone tell you that. <laughs> but I think that's right, that it's the organizations that do the things that you're interested in that you want to look for and, and see if there's opportunities that they have. Mm. Our li libraries and archives all have fellowships that mm. help people get to their collections. Mm -hmm. And then like, what other types of things are there? There, there's some that are through universities. Um, certain mm -hmm. universities have organizations that have funds to give to people to come to the like their archives that they have library archives mm -hmm. there. Um, there's also like I did the Lapidus Omhundro um, fellowship, which take it, it's a it's a pool of money and it involves something like twenty or thirty different or it's a huge amount of, of different research areas like archives and libraries and things. And you make a list of the ones that you plan to go to using the money and they decide if that's good or bad. Um, and they'll give you money accordingly. And I got that one. Um, so I have to go to a few places in Philadelphia, a few places in Boston uh, to meet the uh, expectations of that. that. That one's kind of weird. Most of them are like that. But there's also fellowships that aren't, like, that, that you could find that aren't going to be directly related to, like, like the, the one that John and I did, the one, which was specifically designed around so the, many of the issues that we're talking about here, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, but as you point out, the, the training in quotes, like some right. of the training was like maybe not as great as it could have been. You um, got but free it, trips it, to New York. That's, yeah, that's yeah, yeah free trips to New York. The important thing is um, you got to travel. Right. <laughs> but, but for me, it, that was useful in that it got me out of this sort of. Um, how to phrase this. I think that the there's a tendency to kind of okay, I'm working on my dissertation as you said, like the focus is finishing that dissertation. Like you've got to get it done. And so you kind of hunker down and stop paying attention to what's going on outside of mm -hmm. your focus, right? Outside of your research. And I think that that can be problematic in a number of ways. One is that you don't see all these other kinds of ways that you can use your research, mm -hmm. right? That's what I think what that fellowship was helping to me for. Mm -hmm. so ways that I could do projects that could maybe end up helping me find a job later on, right? Mm -hmm. Cultivating yeah. those other skills. But also I think that that a larger point is just paying attention, whether it's trying to find jobs or trying to find jobs, or paying attention to what else is going on in the world, right? Mm -hmm. Like 
what else is available in Buffalo, right? Like yeah. the Theodore Roosevelt sites, always mm -hmm. looking for docents. The Buffalo mm -hmm. Niagara Heritage Village, always mm -hmm. looking for docents. Do mm -hmm. they pay you? No, and that sucks, right? But once you work there, they like you and they're mm -hmm. going to help you mm -hmm. find a, a paying job. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be cultivating skills that mm -hmm. you can find a job in <clears throat> Washington at some museum. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's like mm -hmm. finding those things, often you just have to be really proactive and paying attention to what's out there. And unfortunately, as you as John mentioned, the side effect of that is taking some time away sometimes from your dissertation, yeah. which depending on who you're working with or what your situation is, you know, your advisor might not be super crazy about that idea, but I, I think that that's, you know, mm -hmm. something that you're going to have to make a decision for yourself to do. So for the application, did you come up with all the organization that you want to work with? How much uh, did you complete the <laughs> plan and everything? So I did the, the laziest path to um, the Public Humanities Fellowship. I'm not sure. <laughs> I might be able to rival you. Yeah, um, <laughs> I worked so hard and didn't get it. So. Yeah, there, there's there's okay. mixed reviews on the public humanities. Um, so I, I learned about it. I think it's due in like early February. Mm -hmm. I learned about it at the end of January. I was living in London at the time doing research. And um, just one day I was like, I should write this up. And so I wrote it up and I thought, you know, vaguely I want to uh, do a research project that focuses on uh, history of poverty and uh, housing problems in Buffalo. And I looked up, uh, there's a few uh, homelessness organizations around town. And so I looked up, um, you know, what those were, what kind of what they do, and uh, put that into my application of I'll try to work with these people. Um, and this is what I'm, I'm going to create a project that highlights uh, housing issues and poverty in Buffalo. Um, I didn't do that hardly at all. And I didn't work with any of those organizations. Um, but that's what I wrote on my application. And, Excuse me. Excuse me. And uh, I got the fellowship, and they didn't care that yeah. my fellowship, that my project at the end looked nothing like what I proposed. That that didn't matter to them. Yeah. Um, so uh, that was very much my experience yeah. too. I, I really wanted the fellowship because I. As again, as I articulated several times, started to realize at one point that like I was never going to get a job, and um, I thought this would be a good way of trying to establish some contacts in the area with people who might be able to help me. Like I was thinking about it as like trying to find a way to cultivate skills outside of my ability to yeah. really write and talk good in class, right, and uh, okay. that sort of thing. And so I did something very similar. Yeah. I thought about. Okay, what do I already know from my dissertation? Like, what am I focusing on? Okay, I'm writing about veterans. We have a very large VA hospital. Yeah. Uh, I am gonna have a symposium about mental health and veterans at South Campus, the bridges between, and it was like, I didn't do anything <laughs> on that project at all. And the, the fellowship, I think, is kind of, is, it's kind of great how they are very flexible about that. Yeah. that you go in, and some people did go in with pre-existing projects. Yeah, some they people were, were already like, working yeah, on this was, this was the next year of something they right. were already doing. That yeah. was not my case. Like, I, no, I had a very pie-in-the-sky sort of idea about this thing that I was going to do. And one good thing about that, I think, is that I realized, oh, those things don't just come together naturally, right? Like, mm -hmm. that takes funding, it takes contacts, I'm going to have to figure out how to write grants, mm -hmm. and that's all more than I can bite off this year. Mm -hmm. But it yeah. did make me, you do have to do something, sort of. I mean, they're not going to take the money away from you, right, at the end of the day. They you also, I never something. had to actually present my project. Oh, really? At, at, in New, I didn't have to present it in New York. I had to present it in Buffalo. Yeah, I did mm -hmm. um, But I was under the impression the entire time that, like, the last day of training was, like, presentations day. Yeah. And then it came and went, and, like, we went out and got beers, and, like, right. no, <laughs> like no presentation happened. Right. And I was just like, oh, I'm free to go now. Like, it was so strange. <laughs> yeah. But I think the, the good thing, even though I didn't do the project I proposed, I ended up doing another project that led me down a different road that yeah. helped me to see all these different things mm -hmm. that I could do. I mean, it, it, for me, it ended up resulting in the podcast that mm -hmm. we asked yeah. yeah. um, And so it was still a benefit, right? Mm -hmm. like, even though it, I, you, I think that 
for a lot of people, you, you go into it thinking that you have to have you already you have to already have all these things in place. You have to have these contacts mm -hmm. and skills in place, mm -hmm. and you really don't. I mean, it mm -hmm. it was a, a way of just kind of seeing outside of mm -hmm. what you are doing every single day, researching and writing and being mm -hmm. in yeah. recitations, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's I can't. That's my biggest advice, which is just like look outside. Yeah. <laughs> what Continuing you're doing to speak today. to that too. Um, one, so I, I'm still a PhD student, so maybe this is a bit risky to say, but I was actively encouraged not to take any employment unless it was a TA position or sure. department yeah. while I was here. And um, I didn't listen, <laughs> and I frequently got scolded for it, but I did anyway. And uh, I'm very glad that I did, mm -hmm. uh, especially given the conversation that's happening here, because that seems to be the consensus is that. Um, you know, maybe there's not enough history jobs, and it's not a terrible idea to uh, get more experience outside the classroom. Um, I say as I still teach in a classroom, but uh, I, you know, I interned at a brewery for three years and considered going down that path. Um, the owner was a historian with a PhD in linguistics, so it was, you know, we had a lot to talk about, a lot of arguments too. But that's the point. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't want to be the one woman, you know, uh, crusade for gender equality in, in the brewery industry. So mm -hmm. I, I got out of that. Um, but you know, now I, I'm teaching Chinese children online on Beijing time. So yes, I've been up since three in the morning. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it's it's very good. I've gotten uh, approached by people looking to uh, open ESL businesses that do essentially the same thing in other countries. Um, I've been approached by Buffalo Public Schools about adult PSL education. Um, I'm sure there's more that I'm not thinking of because I know I got three offers in one day. One day, um, but you know, I, I don't think it hurts to take other employment if you can manage it. Like I'm really fortunate that I'm done working at you know 9 a.m. because that's 10 p.m. Beijing time. <laughs> but um, you know, I can still disappear in the afternoon. I can go on. I can go on a you know a travel. For, research and do it out of my hostel or hotel and mm -hmm. whatever and, and then go research in the archive afterward. So if you can find something like that, that's awesome. Like, I don't see any problem with it. And also, you don't have to worry so much about what's going to happen after you graduate because you have something. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, you're not you're not out in, in the ether. Mm -hmm. yeah. So one of the things I've been struggling, like I'm trying to manage dissertation and the job I'm doing here, and I'm actually I've just finished all the rounds of um you know, um, conference proposals, like I, I gave up so many of them, and it's difficult to keep your enthusiasm with your dissertation, because I've done so much energy rush, and yeah, I did yeah. the roundtable proposal, and yeah, there's somebody, somebody's asking to coordinate some kind of event in the Buffalo Medical School, and so mm -hmm. on, so it's great to have there, but on the other hand, you it's like a dissertation, you using different part of your brain and then yeah. after doing all this project i'm so tired now yeah. i don't know i feel like i can write my dissertation now i'm just got feedback from my advisor saying oh my god this is so much i gotta do so much revision how do i have the, my brain energy to do this yeah. and to keep motivated doing it because i have to do it if you ha you have to like it doing the dissertation but how do you keep that kind of mental energy? I mean, how, how did you guys do it? I mean, I felt like I just kind of, I like finally sat down to write my dissertation after researching for, for like probably way too long. And I was just like, I just word vomited all over the page. Like, I think I wrote like 10 pages in four hours or something. I was mm -hmm. just ready to go. So it was just time for oh. me at least. Um, yeah, that's more or less mm -hmm. my experience too. When I, when I actually sat down to write, I can produce the mm -hmm. dissertation very quickly mm -hmm. um but like like you say going back to do revisions or things like that yeah. and now like even though i don't necessarily want to you know get a professorship or anything i still want to turn my dissertation mm -hmm. into a book i still right. want to publish right. it and have yeah. it out there and that's going to require a whole other level of revisions mm -hmm. and right. you know marketing and finding mm -hmm. a publisher and all this kind of stuff um that i i have no idea how i'm going to go about doing it mm -hmm. um are you interested in um, publishing in an academic public press or the popular press? Do you have any? I'm plans? I'm on the fence about it. Um, on the one hand, I wrote the thing because I want people to read it. Mm -hmm. So obviously not an academic press. 
Um, but on the other hand, I want the like kind of academic, mm -hmm. you know, credence of it right. too. So it, I, I'm still debating that. Mm -hmm. Can I offer some advice? One one thing that I tried to think about mm -hmm. as I was trying to balance this. Mm -hmm working all these side projects right that were designed in my own brain to help make me marketable right or whatever thing it was mm -hmm. going to be you know and writing mm -hmm. was that i tried to think about it in terms of like it sounds really cheesy but like in terms of like seasons right like this is the time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like the, this next couple of months this is when i'm, I'm going to focus on these other things and this is the the goal that i'm working towards mm -hmm. and then when i get to this other kind of season of mm -hmm. my mm -hmm. career or my life then it'll be the time to hunker down and really focus on the writing. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that will require that you say no to stuff. Yeah. Right. You know, right. like but if you if you balance it with mm -hmm. writing, like I'm gonna focus on conferencing and marketing myself and, and fellowships and things for the next mm -hmm. three months. Mm -hmm. But then once I get to September, mm -hmm. I'm saying no to stuff mm -hmm. and I'm gonna sit down and right. I'm gonna do all those revisions mm -hmm. because I wanted to fund on this day. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And then, and that takes, I mean, it's, especially I think for us, we're kind of trained to, to say yes to everything mm -hmm. because you're like hustle, 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 hustle all the time, right? Mm -hmm. To advance yourself. So it feels very heartbreaking to like look at some conference. If someone's asking you to go to this conference, you really want to go because that looks so great on your CV. Mm -hmm. But like at the end of the day, if you don't have a dissertation, you don't have a PhD, right? So you, mm -hmm. you've got to learn how to say yeah. like mm -hmm. no and, and win the knowledge that those kinds of opportunities will come again mm -hmm. later on down the road. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, like I said that I didn't apply to fellowships this year because I spent a lot of time applying to fellowships right. last year. Time. And I, I got Dr. Stapleton's email and I actually read it. I went, man, these are looking real good. Do I have time to do this? And I was like, no, don't do it this year. You have like three other things going on. Just do yeah. those for now. You don't need the money. You're fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you have you have fellowships. Very right? cool. <laughs> but that's hard because you feel you get in a hoarding mode, especially yeah. when it comes to, to money, right? Mm -hmm. As a grad yeah. student, that you you can't say no to any opportunity. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was I had a semester where I was adjuncting, I was teaching five classes, mm -hmm. and somebody offered me an honorarium to write a book chapter, and I said yes to it, and I I made myself sick. Because I had to write, I had to produce essentially an article length work mm -hmm. while teaching five classes on five different mm -hmm. campuses. I don't recommend that. But you get into this like you can't think about anything because what yeah. if you are starving to death living in a box tomorrow, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. It helps to have a job outside of the college, by the yeah. way. Um, yeah. so you know, if anything ever happened to the company that I'm with, there are like five other companies that right. I would be fully booked with classes immediately. <laughs> I know. I just it's, 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 a non it's the exact same feeling. Yeah. Like there's constant opportunities and other organizations, and it's like I can't say no to any of it. Right. So I work eighty hour weeks. Exactly. Like, yeah. 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 It never ends. And yeah. I think in any profession. <laughs> no, it's certainly not just us. I think it's lots of. I think it's. Mm. A, yeah. I think that like we sort of a generational thing, right? For it is. There's, there's yeah. like stuff that came out about millennials and burnout culture. Yeah. Um, yeah. Really yeah. Recently. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, and learning how to manage time and choose your purposes, mm. that's definitely an important part of yeah. professional development. Mm -hmm. And speaking to the, the seasonal kind of thing, uh, this winter was the first winter where I had to actually work. Like, because I've been in academics for so long, it's like you have a month off. Like, you might be, you might be reading and writing, but yeah. you're not, like, going to an office every day. And it's like I had, you know, two days off for Christmas and two days off for New Year's, and I had to go to the office every other day. And it sucked. Like it was, it was a really rude wake up of like I'm not in school anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but also with the seasonal thing and the kind of work I do, um, there's just stuff I can't do during the winter. Like we, we have. Um, I'm starting a community garden and a farmers market, mm -hmm. and nobody's doing anything with that in the winter. Like even if you reach out to people, they're like, yeah, sure, call me in May when <laughs> we're gonna actually do this. <laughs> Um, so you have to figure out, you know, okay, what can I do? And another part of my job is taking food donations to local shelters, which is fine when the weather's nice, and then it's terrible when it's Buffalo. <laughs> and so it's like there's there's a diff, there's like a, a new kind of seasonal thing, um, yeah. you know, sort of related to what Sarah just said, but also just like work patterns like that mm -hmm. exist like outside of academia. You don't get you know four months off a year. 
or you know whatever your case might be. There's uh, just a different time schedule, which I've been in school since I was five. So it's like I'm not used to that. And it was like it was really rough this winter. I think a lot of these similar issues are going to come up over the next few weeks. Mm -hmm. And so um, maybe maybe we can wrap it up now. But I do mm -hmm. want to mention something. Uh, I was talking to Kate Ferguson, the woman mm -hmm. who ran the social impact fellow program for CAS. Mm -hmm. And she mentioned to me that the engineering school actually has a, an interesting approach to professional development mm -hmm. that I, I, I checked it out and it looks really valuable, but I, I wanted to get people's feedback if you're you know, coming to the next session or the session after that or just want to email me. Mm -hmm. It's called something like, I know what it's called, it's called SEAS, which is School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, 360 degrees. Mm -hmm. So if you Google SEAS 360 degrees, you'll go to that webpage. And what they, they offer for engineering graduate students and undergraduates is a chance to kind of register for a certificate and if you complete so many workshops you get a certificate of development and maybe the certificate is not very meaningful but the actual workshops they have are things like gis mm -hmm. and things like budgeting things like you know stuff that looks really practical and at the first session when we were here the intro day uh, professor radford was talking about how you know it'd be really good if people just had a way to train to do a budget so that you know how to do it before you have to apply for a grant, before you have to plan a conference. Yeah. And they seem to offer that kind of thing. So I take a look at their website and see if there's a list of things that you would want College of Arts and Sciences graduate students to have access to. Because I think we could actually go and make a case for the graduate school to make this university-wide. Yeah. And then there might be additional things. If you could think of other kind of, that kind of skill that might be able to be done in a, in a two-hour workshop or a three-hour workshop or whatever, um, mention it to me and I'll add it to the list. Like Professor Radford was saying, um, maybe something about the structure of state government so that if you want to um, go into public history, you need to know like which agencies are interested in that, what's the, what's the support system for that. So a kind of introduction to state government from the point of view of public humanities and, and that kind of skill workshop. If you, if you have any of those things in mind, let me know because we might be able to make it happen. I'm not. I'm not sure we're going to do this starting out two again, mm -hmm. and we're going to get some feedback on it, see whether people want to do it. Uh, it's basically up for up for grabs to talk about whether this is the way, right way to do it. An alternative might be this 360 degree thing that engineering does. Degree. That's not department based, but okay. is university based. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of micro credentials going on. Mm -hmm. That's right. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think that's right. Yeah. 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 Yeah
majority of her job is just writing grants and mm -hmm. she's very good at it. Our, <laughs> our organization is very buoyant. She can bring money in. So it's mm -hmm. like a good skill to have. Mm -hmm. Yes, so that's the one that Professor Stapleton mentioned, the SEAS 360 Certificate Professional Development. So if you have time, especially those who are going to come to our class next week, take a look at it and let us know what you think about this. Is that how can we use it? How much can we refer the grant for my point? Okay, so any other question? So next week will be on collaboration skill. So I invited Andrew Markham. Um, actually, he was a postdoc at the UB on um, the disability related um, project. I mean, I think he's worked at the Smithsonian with Catherine Ott, after who's actually coming to UB for a press conference. So you could ask him about that too, but he's been doing lots of um, advocacy for people with disabilities. So you learn how he's doing lots of collaboration projects with the across the disability community in Buffalo across the board. So that's it. So thank you very much for coming. Don't you have a gesture of appreciation? <laughs> okay, thank you very much for coming. Ah. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> Yes, I have a fish. Thank you. Yes, here you are. Thank you. I'll get your uh, paper. Okay, I'll. Oh. Okay. <laughs> 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 Ready to everyone is the same.